I think we will get started. I see we've reached uh, about, uh, we're approaching 100 attendees. We did have over 270 register, which makes this, as I've said, the largest webinar that we've had. There are uh, just some brief housekeeping notes and then Matt will take over to introduce our speakers. The first is that we encourage you not so much to use the chat at the bottom. The chat feature will connect to the panelists, but please use the Q&A. The reason we ask you to do this type your questions as they come up into the Q&A because they end up being converted into an Excel spreadsheet, which we can give to the speakers after the presentation. So in the next day or two, and they can choose to respond to you via writing or via, you know, via email, basically. So we're, with the number of, of people we have attending today, very large number, it's unlikely we're going to be able to get to everybody's questions, um, so at least today. So that's why it's important to use the Q&A. Type your questions into there, please. Um, if you do uh, put something into the chat, I will respond. Generally, the chat is only open to the panelists. You can't speak to each other. We've had to turn that off. You know, you get strange things happening with large webinars. Sometimes people try to crash them and strange things happen. So we've turned that feature off. So if you have a question, make sure you put it into the Q&A. Um, now, secondly, uh, um, uh, Matt is going to be introducing the speakers, and we also have our CEO here, Mr. Dan McLean from the Petroleum Technology Research Center, who will do a little bit of introducing. The format's going to be that both presentations will be done first. The Q&A will be done at the end of the webinar. And if we find that there is still interest and if you're able to hang around, because this is supposed to be done in an hour, if it ends up being longer than that, we will hold on for a few extra questions. Um, uh, you know, we don't want it to go too far. And yes, there will be a recording of this. All of the recordings are posted at the PTRC YouTube page within a couple of days. We have had uh, three previous webinars, which are posted there right now. And then the next one will, will also be, this one will be posted by Monday, I hope. We have to do some editing on it, but hopefully it will be. So with that, uh, we, I see we're up to 114 uh, attendees, aside from the panelists. I will turn it over to Matt and Matt, you're welcome to actually Dan, our CEO Dan McLean will oh, start sorry. the. Introduce <laughs> Dan, but here's Dan McLean, our CEO. Thanks. All right, thank you, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, exciting for us. This is actually our fourth webinar in a series that we started last year. As you know, the world changed for everybody uh, on or about March 16th last year, and it has forced us to adapt and uh, to look for new ways to reach out uh, to our stakeholders and folks that uh, that uh, we want to to, uh, to share uh, the work that we do with them. This webinar format seems to have uh, been a key way of doing that and uh, we appreciate the time that you're going to take to listen to these presentations today. Uh, I'm going to be very brief here because an hour just goes very quickly here. And we've got two very good presentations that I want you to hear. Uh, but just quickly, the PTRC has been around for 20 years. Uh, we support research in the oil and gas industry, uh, and supporting uh, researchers uh, like the universities and, uh, and folks like the SRC to do this kind of work. Uh, our primary focuses tend to be uh, heavy oil, uh, in particular cold heavy oil production with sand. This is located up in the Lloyd Minster area of Saskatchewan, huge uh, asset for uh, Saskatchewan that uh, is important to us. Uh, uh, we have another category called tight and light. These are tight light oil reservoirs. Uh, and we've uh, emphasized a lot of research on CO2 EOR over the last 15 to 20 years. As well, uh, CO2 storage, Aquastore is a flagship uh, project that uh, we uh, operate all of the research on that. So if you wanna know more about the PTRC, I encourage you to go to our website, ptrc.ca and uh, everything is listed there. So we have two great research uh, providers uh, today, uh, the U U University of Regina and Saskatchewan Research Council. Just a little background on this. A couple summers ago, we put on a workshop uh, uh, in Calgary on tight and light and, uh, and brought in a bunch of operators from Saskatchewan to find out what some of their challenges were. And the work that you're going to hear today actually came out of that. We saw an opportunity to incubate some work on, uh, on 
big data, if you want to call it that, data mining, and you're going to hear about that. And then about a year later, uh, SRC came along and said, we have another project. Do you want to support that? Absolutely. It's, this is right in line with it. So we have two interesting projects for you today. I want to thank both the University of Regina and SRC in advance for participating in this today. And I want to thank them for their continued uh, uh, participation in the PTRC research community. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt uh, for introductions and get things kicked off. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Matt Nassay. I'm Manager of Operations at the Petroleum Technology Research Center at the PTRC. I've had the pleasure and honor of managing the EOR research programs at PTRC for the past three years. Our monthly webinars deal with different topics, as Dan uh, mentioned, in the energy sector. And today we will hear from researchers at the Saskatchewan Research Council and the University of Regina talking about artificial intelligence or AI in the oil and gas. Um, AI applications have certainly been growing in every sector and industry. It has been uh, suggested by some studies that about uh, $20 trillion of GDP will be added by 2030 on the basis of AI. Uh, in the oil and gas sector, the applications have been a bit limited till now, but I think the time has come and we will see a very fast increase in AI-based innovations in the oil and gas sector. The AI that we'll be talking about today and you'll hear about um, is certainly different from the uh, Hollywood versions and the, uh, the ones that we see in the science fiction movies. Uh, the AI is really not about artificial intelligence because of uh, the reality is that the only intelligence that the machines have is what we give them, right? The AI is actually application of computing capabilities that are available to us today to solve problems. Um, as an expert put it, we provide machines the ability to examine examples and create machine learning models based on the inputs and the desired outputs. Uh, to put it more uh, sort of accurately, um, uh, we should say that AI is actually machine learning. It is about using mathematics in computers uh, and finding patterns in data. The difference between the AI uh, that's available today and we use and what we used to do before is that um, in the old technologies, we had to actually go and hard code these patterns and conditions into the computers. But now the computer capabilities that we have uh, makes it possible for the computers to actually find these patterns themselves. Uh, computers use the mathematical algorithms that we give them to find patterns that we may not even know exist. One thing is really important though, in this regard. AI does not replace the human expertise and judgment. It enhances it and supplements it, but it does not replace it. Without the deep technological and technical expertise and knowledge of petroleum engineers and industry experts, AI applications will not be very successful. Again, as one expert put it, there is no use in applying AI if you can't understand or explain the outcomes or detect bias or prove the accuracy of the results. Therefore, successful application of AI greatly depends on combined knowledge of the field experts with powerful computing capabilities that are available to us today. So without any further delay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to our presentations. The first presentation is by Dr. Behrouz Hosseini from uh, Saskatchewan Research Council. I'm not going to tell you what he's going to tell you. Uh, it's certainly better to hear it from him uh, talking about it himself. So Behrouz, please take it away. So we see the full screen, right? Yep. 
Okay, perfect. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction. Um, so Matt said it all didn't really leave much for us to present, but it was really good introduction of AI. I'm talking about the use of AI in oil and gas today, um, as um, it's been really delayed in oil and gas, I believe. Uh, my name is Beruz Hosseini. I'm working for Saskatchewan Research Council in the Mining and Energy Division. Um, so basically the outline of the presentation is fundamentals of AI and machine learning, the advantages of AI, especially in energy sector, and some use examples of application of AI in the oil and gas industry. So let's start with what is AI. Um, so AI, as Matt said, is like to make machine and computers intelligent, like we want them to think like humans. The right hand side diagram, I'm sure you have seen different version of it. This is my take from going through <clears throat> different researches and reading. And basically the top uh, thing is AI and data science is a subset of AI and machine learning is a subset of AI too. So basically what makes machine learning outstanding is really training or learn from data through use of computer algorithms. And most of these algorithms are basically open source algorithms and deep learning is a subset of machine learning and multi-layer machine learning if you like. It is statistics which we have heard the name like years ago or decades ago, if not centuries, is really some different science that has some overlap with machine learning, data science, um, AI basically. And the more data you have for machine learning, the better your mother skills means the more data is fed into it, it it's gonna perform better in time. But it's basically, to my understanding, it's not really a um, correct perception to think that you need lots of data to do AI or machine learning. There are ways around it like K-fold cross-validation, for instance, that you can get use of that if you don't have lots of data to work with to just do your AI still and do prediction. So now that we know AI, let's look at the importance of AI. So I'm going to make the importance from two points of view, one the technical and one the business points of view. The technical point of view is um, short and sweet. AI can model complex problems, especially when there are lots of variables you cannot feed into one analytical model or numerical model. Lots of features, lots of variables play their own role, makes the problem complex. So that's one, that's when you want to get use of AI to tackle those problems. Time. So even with clusters of CPU, you see like when you have a very big model with lots of grids in there, in the oil and gas or computational fluid dynamics, let's say a simulator, you have the problem with time. So AI is really quite fast. And the methodology is a little bit less biased. By that, I mean, it really relies on the data itself, not assumptions involved in a simulator or an analytical model. From the business point of view, um, so um, I'm going to cite um, Geoffrey Kahn, the, uh, the author of the very famous book, Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, which I took a course with him a while ago. So my take and like from the gist of what he said is that going digital for all sectors is now necessary, including oil and gas, which this application has been really delayed. And that's why we haven't seen the impact that it's going to have because it's been delayed. Being competitive is another important point of view, business point of view, because if you want to be competitive to your peer or other companies, you need to go AI. Agility, like if you want to find a solution really uh, quite fast in a deep dive fashion or uh, fast to fail approach, then AI is the right route to take. And if you want to predict revenue, so revenue is the main drive for all businesses. And if you want to have a good idea of it, and make the optimized decision on that basis, then you need to take AI into account. So with that, let's see how we can do AI. So there are different workflows out there to do an, a machine learning algorithms, um, like example of which is the CRISP, which I cited it here. But like I have uh, my own version of it, which is really a straightforward. There is probably no other way around it, except people can have other chunks in there if they like that you start always with a business or a problem. I want to predict the hazard. I want to augment revenue. I want to even have added insight. Then look at the available data that you have. They could be structured or unstructured. And then you want to do the modeling on your data. So this really takes time, pre-processing data, wrangling, dealing with missing data. It's all under this umbrella. And once you are decided about the model, whether it's supervised, unsupervised, whether, <clears throat> 
the model is regression or classification, you want a platform to implement that model on. And after that, um, you are looking for model evaluation. The very um, basic one is R squared, um, Statistics 101, that um, you look at the training and validation R squared or different metrics or errors. And once you're confident, this is the best model, you go to the model, run it again, and you, do, you go through it like iteratively. And after you're done with this loop, now you are in a position to do prediction or really optimization. So let's walk through it. So <clears throat> I'm assuming, <clears throat> sorry, you know what business is. And now let's look at the data. So in the oil and gas industry, uh, data uh, come from different sources, but we are basically trying to emphasize more on the hard data or hard constraints, if you like, example of which are well logs. So this is the right exam. The right hand side is an example of a well log data that is tabular. You could have thousands of rows of samples in there for each well, and it could have thousands of numbers of wells under one another, and they are your data to start with. And geology and characterization data, such as porosity, Permeability is not really a hard data because basically it's being interpreted and seismic data and operational data could be, let's say, drilling data in time, distributed acoustic sensing, bottom hold pressure, and um, like pump failures, failure in time, and the additives you use for, let's say, EOR. And the lab data are rock mechanics, let's say, triaxial data, PVT, special core analysis. These are all of your input features or predictors, if you like, to start your modeling with. And then you go to your platform. So there are different platforms out there. One of the very famous one is Python. It's a programming language because it's a programming language. It's customized. It has access to many machine learning and deep learning libraries. And that is why it's very popular, especially if you're a coder. But when it comes to really big data, Python has really has hard time to bite off more than it can chew. And even you can surprise a big Python. That is why corporates get use of different platforms like Hadoop, Spark, or cloud computational platforms. Plus they want to have their data backed up, secure, and also integrated with different tools such as Power BI, Excel, or in a Spark, they want to have memory computing versus on disk computing. There, there are different pros and cons for every, every single tool. I'm not going to go through these gory details, but basically they are the platforms that companies decide based on their policy to have their workflow or their um, modeling implemented on. After that, let's look at the output. So we know the features, we talked about the data. So what is the output we are trying to predict or optimize for conventional or tight oil reservoirs, example of which are production rate, water oil ratio, rate decline analysis in heavy oil steam allocation has been a challenge. I want to allocate the available limited steam wisely between different pad. The geohazard um, divisions of problems induce seismicity, for instance, you're injecting lots of under of water into underground reservoir or pipeline integrity, caprock integrity or CO2 storage. They're example of the problems you want to optimize or predict if they're going to happen or not, or geothermal. And a very famous time series problem is history matching and forecast. So let's look at a um, selective example of application of AI in oil and gas. So let's just start with use of AI. Um, so there are three cases you're going to present here, one of which is in the lab scale, the other one uh, well scale, and the other one very large field scale. The lab scale is use of AI for reservoir rock characterization. And a case large unconventional reservoir with thousands of wells is another example um, I wanted to present today. And application of machine learning, like for time series analysis type of uh, problems. So let's start with the lab problem. So the objective that um, we wanted to just um, address was to make an understanding of reservoir rock properties. Here is the geomechanical properties or stiffness of the, the rock, if you like, without destructing the rock sample. So most of these experiments, uh, such as uh, geomechanical experiment, uh, the rock is triaxially loaded and it breaks in shear to obtain the reservoir properties, such as, um, let's say, Young moduli, Poisson ratio, bulk moduli. And we don't want that. Sometimes we don't have enough of cores to do it. Sometimes we don't want to break the rock because they are valuable to us. You want to do other tests on it. And sometimes um, the core is really fragile and you don't want to break it 
because it cannot sustain that triaxial load. So how should we address this problem? So one way is like digital rock physics or segmentation. Um, I wrote a paper here in Arma. You're more than welcome to go and read it. Um, and basically you CT scan your rock. On the right hand side, you see the 3D scan feature and you train each 2D segment of your rock. Um, you train it in a way that this portion, the darkest streak is sand, the widest streak is let's say clay rich. How do we know that? Because we did XRD or chem scan analysis on it. We know this is sand, we know this is clay and what is the present component in each a streak or portion if you like and we segment it out there are different segmentations out there under deep learning category um, let's say um, global thresholding under thresholding uh, or local thresholding or iterative clustering image clustering that you can cluster your image to segments and once you're done with that so this is my volume of sand this is my volume of clay i want to average them out by existing physics so i'm combining physics with machine learning here. I can get use of some rock physics problem here, such as Preef, Noor, there are tons of them out there and in the uh, very famous in the rock physics. And you want to average out these properties and get what we call the static bulk moduli. From the lab, we have them because after we CT scan and we send them to lab, we measure the properties. And from AI, we have them. And based on the physics of the problem that you pick, sometimes you could have very close results. So this is really cool. Like you could have your um, data out of a core without destructing it if you train your image and sample uh, more and more and more. Another example is a very large field case here. So we had initially more than 3000 of wells in an unconventional uh, field in somewhere in the Western Canada. The data was initially more than 30 gigs and we just, uh, uh, broke the data, narrowed it down and we came up with some model initially for your modeling, you want to do exploratory data science to have a better insight about your data. And then you want to do machine learning to find a model to do the prediction for you. So in terms of exploratory data science, this model was implemented in Python. Um, correlational maps like uh, Pearson correlations. You want to know the features correlation to one another. The features are your input, let's say here, and your target, the, the drive of revenue is cumulative oil here. And you want also to know the relationship of your VI or your target variable versus other features. Number one means a very high correlation, minus one also is a correlation, but negative correlation. And 0.66, for instance, among these all number of features is a good thing. That's the average frac spacing. And I want to look at that here also on the pair plot. If there is a correlation, how that correlation is, is it linear? So we know there is some relationship there and it's, it's a good news, but it's a univariate analysis. You want to have all of those features included under one umbrella and you want to have the impact of them under one another. So from the linear algebra theory, you can get use of different least square approaches and also um, getting use of multilinear regression. And other tools to do the data in initial data analytics or inside, if you like, is visual analytics. I, I call it visual analytics. It's not only data or curves or plot or statistics that can be really fruitful and meaningful to you. Um, here we plotted our data, drilling cost, completion cost, and prop and tonnage in a longitude latitude format. Um, and we looked at our data. So data type could be a spatial such as univariate or multivariate data distributed on a map, or they could have a time component in them, the temporal changes of thing, which we call them time series analysis type of machine learning. And these data provide not only initial insight, but some additional insight. So here, for instance, we know by the physics of problem, there is a relationship between completion cost and prop and tonnage. But if we want to see it on the map and the hotter these curves are, um, the larger the level of, um, the correlation are basically. But drilling cost doesn't have by physics of the problem any relationship to the prop and tonnage, or we don't know. That's why we plot them to see if there is really any correlation between them at least here in this location. But down there somewhere else in the province, there wasn't really much of correlation between let's say drilling cost or prop and tonnage. And then there are some other type of maps. Like again, this is a, an example of folium map in Python. You can grid your domain 
to different geopolitical grids, if you like, uh, based on the policy of the company. I look at, I want to look at this launch and lat only framework of the data, and it can define your pop up. You click on each grid and gives you, for instance, the average frac number of frac stages for each horizontal valve in there. This is all fracking about, um, or let's say water flow, whatever it is. And then you want to, for instance, know the fluid pumped in there or the propane use amount of propane there. On top of this basic map and like number of wells that you can see in each grid and distribution of them, you can do further. You can just obtain a distribution of properties in terms of clusters of the data. Another example of it is like heat maps. You can combine it with something we call DB scan. It's a density-based scanning approach. Actually, it's an unsupervised clustering technique. The advantage of DB scan versus the conventional um, clustering approaches, such as k-means, is that you don't need to know the number of clusters you have. All you need is like basically the search radius here, and you want to cluster your properties. Let's say the production number of well stages, number of like um, um, wells in each domain or region, and you want to map it there example of these useful maps and you have your clusters of data that could have irregular shape if you use db scan there you could have one cluster inside another one and they're very meaningful and it's not only one feature that you could have in one cluster you could have combination of all like for instance in geothermal the heat the temperature map of a geothermal can tell you lots of information is it really a sweet spot for geothermal or in SAR data that can give you the ground displacement numbers in orders of um, millimeter and you, um, for instance, for SAGD, I see people can get use of that to just cluster their experiments or their measurements or pipeline transmission. Um, you can combine it also with some statistical approaches and get use of DB scan for pipeline transmission or level of corrosion of pipeline in a space and also in time. Here is a zoomed version of the properties you can see on these maps. And then you do real modeling here. By modeling, there are lots of hidden layers down there, but the basic concept is that you pick your model, whether it's regression, whether it's classification, depending on your Y vector or target valuable. The, what are my important features? If it's polynomial regression, I'm going to get use of what is the degree of order of the polynomial. You plot your, let's say, decline exponent versus different individual properties and combined version of them. That's a total fluid pump. And then you go through all of available regression models. Here we decide to go regression because our Y vector is numerical, right? And then you come with your final model and then you do grid search on it. You do hyperparameter tuning. There are lots of hidden layers in there and you come with a final model in there. Your final model tells you whatever your Y vector was in a predicted versus measured one. You hold on to some data for validation and you try to compare your predicted one versus the measured test um, data that you have hold on to, to look at the accuracy of your model. And if this is your final model, you went through that iterative approach that I talked about, then now you're in a position to do optimized decision-making or forecast, new data, new forecast. This is an example of a large field case, as I said. Another example of predictive models is time series analysis. So uh, this is an example from CMOS. I really like it, I've worked with it before, that it can do some automation for you here. But when it comes to simulators, again, they have their own downside as well. They can be time consuming, especially if the problem is large. And um, the other thing, if the problem is large, you need to have thousands of wells in there to have your net present value. You cannot judge by only one well in there. That is why, Sometimes you need to go only AI or combine it with simulators. I've seen different arguments. Some people are reluctant to get use of simulators along with AI or data science because and their arguments some, somehow could be valid in some cases because you're relying on data. Remember, you want to be unbiased as much as possible. So if you mix something, some physics such as simulators or analytical model with your data, you're losing that advantage here. And so you can combine it with probabilistic analysis here. This is an example of a Monte Carlo model. So after you're done with your machine learning, you can build your own model and do probabilistic analysis. Here's an example of um, uh, one work that we did before to see the probability of induced hazard that is going to happen based on the amount, uh, based on the 
um, pore pressure induced on the fault surface. You want to know the probability of this event um, to happen or not on top of your machine learning. The same concept can be applied to sand production. Casing collapse, what is the probability of it going to happen? Here, we are looking at the probability of pore pressure to happen that led to that earthquake induced seismicity. How did it happen? Because of injection of salt water disposal somewhere in BC. Pump failure is another example of these problems that you can combine probabilistic analysis with AI that I've seen oil and gas sector has get um, use of it before. And the last example, this is an idea. Um, I haven't worked on it yet, but let's say you have a 2D sector out of a 3D model, you have different class of problems here, class one, two, three, five, and this class could have different meaning in them. It could be some geological features of faces, if you like. It could be some drilling pattern or drilling problem, class of problems, and they're all velpers that are going into the valve or into the plane here. And now you have an area that you have no idea about it. You want to drill new wells. So you want to know it belongs to class one, class two, class three, or four, or five. An approach that you can get use of under classification approach is KNN, K nearest neighbor. I'm not going to go through the math behind it, but basically you decide how many number of K or neighbors you, you want to have, and then you predict it's going to belong to which class of problems here. Basically, you're learning. It's not really a lazy learner, KNN. You're actually memorizing your data, and then you decide which class of problem it's going to belong to. So in conclusion, use of AI was shown is still quite novel and potentially useful in both upstream and downstream. Uh, we showed a um, few examples um, here that and ex successful examples of getting use of AI. Machine learning workflows were shown to be more of a predictive uh, component of AI, at least in the examples that we show. And data analytics basically is more of diagnostic or predictive uh, modeling type. Data-driven approach has shown historically to provide several advantages, including a speed, unbiasedness, ability to work on large amount of data. They're easily customized and they can be automated. And AI um, in oil and gas industry can be applied to different scales, not, not only lab or valve, but also field or a combination of them all. Thank you very much. With that, I pass it to Matt to introduce the next presenter. Thank you, everyone. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Berus, for a very good uh, presentation. There are some questions. We'll get to the questions uh, sure. uh, at the end. Uh, so our next presenters um, are a group of researchers, um, a team of PhD researchers from uh, petroleum engineering, software engineering, and electronic systems engineering at the University of Regina under supervision of Dr. Sharif uh, at the Petroleum Systems Engineering and Dr. Elder Yavi, Professor of uh, Software Engineering. I leave it to the presenters to introduce themselves and uh, talk about their work. Uh, please, uh, George or Mohammed, uh, who is sure. starting? Please go ahead. Sure. Hi, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt, for introducing us. Today, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon to everyone. Today, we are going to talk about the uh, machine application of machine learning techniques in our well and gas industry. How we can develop a predicting model using uh, the machine learning techniques and how we can uh, predict the future production and how can we optimize our current production. This work is supervised by Dr. Ezid Din Sharif and Dr. Mohammed el -Durafi. Next. Yeah, here is the uh, today's content. Uh, we need to provide the brief uh, introduction and objectives and then the how we can predict the production using the proxy model and how we can perform the sensitivity analysis to find out the most influential parameters that can affect a particular petroleum process. And then we need to perform the history matching, how we can match our field production history using the artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques. Then we need to take a decision whether uh, which technique we have to use to optimize our current production than the conclusion. 
actually this uh, collaborative research and development project is started six months ago and it's a multidisciplinary project it needs the prior knowledge of petroleum engineering and computer engineering so that we can predefine our problem and how we can make a solution for this problem that's why we need a uh, short time to uh, learn a lot of things and why actually we are using the artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques for petroleum industry because most of the today's well and gas industry actually face several challenges to ensure that their wells are achieving the optimum production or not because there are lots of uncertainties are associated with the petroleum uh, with the reservoir system because of their different geological setting underneath the surface so uncertainties are there and companies are also looking at digital technologies and state of the art artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques to solve all of those problems that's why uh, we are using here the machine learning technique and also in, in order to study complex reservoir system, we need to run the conventional simulation system quite a several time uh, to find out their effect and the um, mechanism associated with this. So it takes a time and also the cost associated with this one is high and also the conventional simulation software uh, does not have that much of uh, flexibility. They have the predefined features, we, so we cannot go beyond those uh, predefined features. Uh, but if we apply the artificial intelligence, it will definitely give us the accurate uh, prediction using the artificial intelligence and the prediction will be faster. And it also has the flexibility to use the different kind of reservoir for the same model. Next. So here, uh, the main purpose of this project is to build the proxy model and train that proxy model because uh, the production prediction is critically vital for well and gas companies and it be, uh, and uh, because it drives the business deci decisions and help the industry plan for the future. That's why we need to build that model so that it can exactly mimic the real reservoir so that we can predict uh, the future production and then we can characterize the reservoir using this proxy model. That means how much rock, uh, uh, fluid is there in the reservoir and also the pressure distribution throughout the reservoir. And then uh, from the sensitivity analysis, we can find out uh, the most influential uh, parameters for a particular uh, process, whether it is steam flooding, solvent flooding, uh, solvent injection techniques. And then after that, we need to perform the history matching because history matching is very important. Once we uh, match, our, match our field production history, that means uh, our proxy model can work very well and uh, we can match, uh, we can do further analysis uh, with uh, less uncertainties. And after that, we need to perform the production optimization techniques. We need to take decision whether, whether we have to drill new wells or whether we have to convert our existing wells to the injection well or, uh, or whether we have to implement the near, uh, hydraulic, near well bore hydraulic fracturing. And in order to attain those uh, objectives, we have to experiment with different neural network architectures. Here are, uh, in this project, we are actually using the neural network, recurrent neural network, short, long, uh, long short-term uh, memory, and the convolutional neural network. Here is the total um, workflow for our um, projects. Once we, uh, as I told earlier, uh, we need to build that proxy model. So in order to build that proxy model, once we have the real field data, then we need to train our real field data using the neural network to build that proxy model. But if we don't have that real field data, then we need to use the conventional simulation software so that we can generate those data and train our model to build that synthetic reservoir model. Once we have that uh, uh, pretty, uh, developed proxy model, then we need to analyze the fluid flow throughout the reservoir. In fluid flow, from the fluid flow analysis, we, we can easily find out the different rock and fluid properties of the reservoir and also the fluid saturation and pressure distribution throughout the reservoir. So once we're done uh, uh, with our proxy modeling and the fluid flow analysis, then we have to perform the sensitivity analysis using the recurrent neural network. From the sensitivity analysis, we can find out the most influential parameters that can actually affect a particular process. 
So once until uh, once we're done with this uh, sensitivity analysis, then we have to match our field production history using the real field history data. The purpose of doing the history matching is to predict the future production and how our reservoir will behave in future. We can find out from this uh, history matching. And once we're done with the history matching, then we have to decide how we can optimize our production using this uh, neural network. Next, uh, uh, from this slide, uh, from this, this slide, uh, my friend Muhammad Ahmed will present. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ahmed. I'm a PhD student in electronic system engineering. And uh, in, uh, can you hear me? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so in this part, we will uh, predict the remaining and the future gas, water, and oil production in the reservoir. Here is the um, the proposed model. Uh, actually, we divided the data set into 70% uh, as a training data and 30% as a testing data to predict the remaining uh, production on the on the reservoir. We designed actually three different machine learning approaches uh, to forecast the remaining production rate in the reservoir. Uh, these approaches include uh, neural network model, uh, recurrent neural network, and long short term, uh, term memory. Uh, as you can see from the uh, uh, figure in the left side, uh, the input data is uh, the average pressure and the average gas, oil, and water saturations, and the output. Uh, data that we want to predict actually is the uh, gas and water and, and oil production. Uh, actually, we have two case studies um, just to uh, validate our own model or test our model. We will start with scenario one. Uh, okay, okay, ahead, go ahead. Okay, here is a scenario one. Um, Actually, to test the proposed model, we started with a scenario one, which is a simple case study, a homogeneous reservoir with one production well. Uh, and to validate the proposed models, we compared the output result with the CM CMG production rate. Um, as, you key, as you can see from the result, um, the, uh, from left to right, uh, this is the output result for gas production, uh, oil production, and water production rate. And uh, for the three models, and we're comparing it with the CMG uh, uh, output. Uh, from the result, you will find that the three models output gives the uh, same output, uh, approximately the same output as a CMG model. Uh, and if you can see the table below uh, showed the mean approximation percentage error between each model output and the CMG output you will find that in the three scenarios, the percentage of error is less than, approximately less than 1% or less than that, actually. And um, we can say the main advantage of using this machine learning approach or these models is that their results are accurate and the computation time is faster than CMG simulation. If you can see that training time, uh, you will find it's less than 15 uh, seconds and the testing uh, time as well, it's approximately 10 millisecond, and this is so fast. Uh, then we, uh, to just test our model with like another scenario, which is more complicated a little bit, uh, we um, tested that model with a homogeneous reservoir with one production well and four injection well, uh, wells. Uh, as you can see here, the, the result from left to right as well, the gas production rate, oil production rate, and water production rate, and we compare the three, uh, the output model with the CMG uh, production output. Um, I, as you can see, there is a small mismatch between the neural network model output and CMG model. Therefore, we used the LSTM model to improve this error. Um, which gave a good result, as you can see. The percentage of error uh, in, the, in the table, you can see it's less than 0.5% uh, approximately. Um, uh, this is the production uh, prediction for these scenarios. My friend George will speak about another scenario just to validate our model to, or to test our model, is it work well or not? Hello all, uh, I'm George Dawood, a PhD student at the University of Regina. Uh, in this third scenario, we implemented a machine learning model uh, that uh, predicts the uh, block pressure and uh, block saturation for, all, for each grid block in uh, a radial uh, single well, single layer uh, homogeneous reservoir. Uh, as shown in the figure, uh, um, 
uh, the block shape is a concentric ring with a well at the center uh, to predict uh, the pressure and saturation at a certain day uh, we need to uh, an input to our model uh, that the pressure and saturation at the previous day uh, as well as the distance uh, for that uh, block from uh, the well which is called the radius now and uh, uh, the difference in well pressure and saturation to implement this model, uh, we got our data from a simulator, which is CMG, and divided it into halves, uh, training data, which is used to train our model, uh, and testing data, which is used to test the model to uh, be sure that it's general. Uh, here's the table uh, shows the, the mean absolute percentage error uh, for uh, both training data set and testing data set. Uh, also, we did a successive uh, prediction. In this successive prediction, we start uh, at day zero with the initial conditions of the reservoir and they predict the, uh, the first day and using the prediction of the first day to predict the second day and use the prediction of second day to predict the third day and so on until the end of the period. Uh, and this, uh, the figure here shows uh, the daily mean absolute percentage error per, for this successive prediction for pressure and for saturations. Uh, to show you the result, uh, we choose uh, day 1000 after a 1000 day successive prediction. Here is our result. The, uh, the uh, plots of the figures from left to right, it's pressure, uh, oil saturation, gas saturation, water saturation, or are, are drawn versus uh, the uh, distance from the well or the radius in x, in, in x axis uh, at day 1000. Uh, for each curve, uh, for each block, there are two curves, uh, one given by CMG and the other uh, is predicted by our uh, model. This is in the first row. In the second row, there is a relative error between uh, two curves and, and as you can see, it is less than 0.3 percent. Then we updated our model to work with a Cartesian coordinate. In Cartesian coordinate, as you can see, uh, the block, each block uh, has a cuboid shape, as you see in the figure. Uh, and our model is trained uh, by training data and testing data, as you can see in the figure. In the table, there is uh, the mean absolute percentage error for both. Uh, and uh, in the figure, um, we illustrate you is a daily mean absolute percentage error due to successive prediction using our model. And here is the result. This is after 1,000 day uh, prediction, successive prediction. Um, uh, the figure uh, or image from left to right, uh, you can see uh, in the first row is the pressure um, uh, according to CMG, then the pressure uh, uh, predicted by our model, then the relative error. Uh, each figure of this uh, represents the whole reservoir with, with each a point or pixel in the image represent a grid block. And beside to each figure, there is a color bar that map uh, the color of uh, this grid block to a value. Uh, for example, if you look to the uh, relative error, uh, the rightmost figure, uh, the blue color uh, represents an error nearly zero. And as the error increases, uh, the color increases to red uh, to an error on about 0.27 percentage. Uh, also, the, uh, in the second row, this is the same, but for oil saturation. And for this slide, this is the gas, gas saturation and the water saturations. Then we implemented another model for heterogeneous reservoir. For heterogeneous reservoir to predict the pressure and saturation for each block at a certain day, we need uh, the values of uh, this pressure and, uh, and the saturation uh, for that block at previous day, as well as the, its neighbors at this, at the, this previous day. Uh, also, we included the porosity and the permeabilities uh, to our model. And here is uh, the table shows the mean absolute percentage error for our model. Uh, and the figure shows the successive prediction mean absolute percentage error daily. And these are uh, um, our result after 2000 successive prediction. Uh, the first row is uh, for uh, pressure, uh, and uh, you can see that the error is less than 0.1 percentage, and uh, the second row for oil saturation, uh, and uh, um, the, this first row is uh, for gas saturation. Again, in the same order, uh, CMG predicted by our model, and then uh, uh, the relative error between both. Uh, and the last row is water saturation. 
uh, all these errors are less than 0.5 percentage. And then we tried the same uh, reservoir model, but using um, another uh, machine learning architecture, we use convolutional neural network, uh, which is faster in, uh, in terms of pre-processing data. Um, and uh, using this for the same model, we got the, the following training data uh, and uh, testing data error, uh, which is low, it's less than 0.6 percentage. Uh, and uh, if we did a successive prediction, uh, here is the curve that shows the, the daily mean absolute percentage error for this successive prediction. And they're choosing uh, day 2000. Uh, again, uh, this is the result uh, in which the pressure is shown in the first row and the oil saturation in the second row. And here is the gas saturation and the water saturation. You can see that the error is too small. Uh, and so that we can use our model uh, instead of simulators. And from here, Mohammed will continue. Okay. Um, in this part, actually, we um, we want to um, our, the purpose of conducting a sensitivity analysis is to find out the most influential parameters on production. Therefore, we designed uh, uh, this model. Um, actually, the proposed model consists of two parts. The first part is the is to predict the average pressure and saturation throughout the whole horizon using the uh, recurrent neural network approach. Then, the second part is to predict the production rates. What we have is only the static parameters such as permeability, porosity, and so on, and the initial average pressure and average saturation at day one. So this is only that we have that the static parameters and the initial values at day one average pressure, average saturations, and also from the saturation values, we could know the, uh, the relative permeability. So uh, what exactly uh, this model will do from day one data, we can predict the average pressure and average saturation at day two. And from day two, we can predict day three. And from day three, you can predict four and so on until the, the end of uh, the whole horizon. So the challenge here is how can we predict the variation of dynamic parameters, parameters from static parameters? This is challenging, and actually we uh, we solved this using the machine learning approaches. Uh, let's see that the output results. And this next slide. Okay, here is the result that we got. Um, actually, first to, to test our model, we want to see the, the effect of ch changing the permeability from 700 to 900. So uh, we chose just one variable, the permeability to test our model. And also to validate the proposed model, we compared the output result with CMG output results. As you can see, the results are the same, approximately the same as, uh, as the CMG. Uh, if you can see the first figure in your on the left, this is the average pressure at 700 and 900 from the, uh, from the proposed model and from the CMG model, you will find it's approximately the same. So approximately there is no difference or the error is approximately less than 1% as well. And the same for gas saturation and oil, gas, oil saturation and water saturation and, and all um, in, in the two scenarios. Um, then after we predict already the, like the, these uh, param parameters, uh, pressure and saturations, we now can predict the, um, uh, like the output uh, production uh, rate as you can see, the production increased with increasing the permeability from left to right. The oil uh, production uh, cumulative it's uh, in, in 900 is uh, higher than 700, and the same for gas production cumulative and for water production cumulative. So that this means that our model works well, and actually we can uh, do that for different uh, variables, not only for permeability for the. <laughs> The whole static parameters we can change and we can predict the variation of the production depending on the variation of the uh, input uh, parameters. Go ahead, George. And now uh, for history matching, uh, the history matching uh, we are using here, the act of history matching is to, you know, match our uh, match our pr uh, production field history. So here is the system architecture uh, for the history matching. First, we need to uh, we need to use the 
based geological model. And if we have, have the field production data, then we have to also use the static parameters from the sensitivity analysis. Then we need to run our proxy model. Once we run our proxy model, we need to calculate the misfit. Once we calculate the misfit, if it is not matched, then we need to again go back to the sensitized parameters. We need to tune some of those parameters. Again, run the proxy model to, uh, to find out the misfit. Uh, we have to perform this uh, trial and error basis until unless we get a good match. So once we get the good match, then we can use this as an, our prediction model. Actually, the, um, the accuracy of history matching depends on the quality of the proxy model and the quality and quantity of the pressure and production data we have. Once a model has a history match, it can be used to simulate the future reservoir behavior with a higher degree of accuracy and confidence. Next. Now, here uh, we have to how we can optimize after performing all those tasks how we can optimize our current productions so once we have our proxy model then we have to uh, we have to perform the fluid flow analysis from the fluid flow analysis we will be able to find out the different rock and fluid properties uh, of the reservoir and also the fluid saturation and distribution uh, distribution at each grid block of the reservoir with time once we have those ones then it will be easier for us to make it the decision whether we have to drill new well or whether we have to convert our existing production well to injection well and whether we have to do some uh, near well bore stimulation uh, so that we can optimize our production using the neural network. And also from the sensitivity analysis, we already have uh, the optimized parameter so we can use those optimized parameter as an input parameter so that we can can easily we can easily optimize our current production now here is the conclusion in conclusion we just wanted to say that uh, we just wanted to say that uh, the, our build proxy model is very good in predicting the production and also the fluid saturation pressure distribution and finding out the rock and fluid properties throughout the reservoir, which will ultimately help us to which will ultimately help us to to decide how our reservoir will behave in future. And also, we can find out the most influential parameters that can affect the particular process using this proxy model. And then we can also perform the history matching to match with the field history uh, that will help us uh, to make decision about the production optimization technique. That means uh, which techniques we just have to use here. The good thing about our proxy model is that um, the result, once we compare uh, our analysis, fluid flow analysis result with the result uh, from the CMJ, then we get that our uh, model accuracy is uh, relative error is uh, 0.5 percent, which is a um, very good match, um, and also the production of well and gas is a complex process, and it also needs a lot of decision making uh, in order of uh, short term, long term, uh, or mid term uh, decision making. That's why we need to work collectively using the artificial intelligence how we can optimize our pr production um, using the least computational time and effort, um, and then. Uh, in conclusion, I would just like to say that uh, the artificial intelligence is the future for the well and gas industry, as artificial technology is also doubtlessly a new shining star uh, that draws the attention from the researchers and they devoted themselves into it. And using this artificial intelligence or machine learning technique, we can easily uh, build the complex uh, algorithms so that we can explore the uh, unconventional reservoir, that means the tight well shale gas reservoir, and also the heavy oil reservoir. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, Dr. M uh, Dr. Ezzedin Sharif and Dr. Mohammed El Darebi for their continuous support and supervision throughout this project and also the University of Regina. I also like to thank PTRs and MITEX for funding this project and also the computer uh, modeling group for providing us the uh, simulation software package. Thank you all and if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Arafur, Mohammed, and George for your presentation. 
Uh, we have, uh, it's almost uh, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock Saskatchewan time, but uh, we, we can spend a few minutes uh, answering a few questions. Um, so if, is there uh, I'm not sure. particular one, Beirut, you wanted to pick first or not? Um, I mean. One or two. <clears throat> so I saw uh, different questions. Um, which portion of the data to pick 20%, 30% rule of thumbs is 20%, but you can go through a loop. Uh, to check different portions of data if you like. Um, decision trees uh, was also uh, asked, can you see my slides? Uh, let me see if I can quickly share the screen. So a uh, random forest basically are ensemble of some weak learners, if you like, ensemble of some uh, three class of problems. So they usually are good for, for overfitting problems. So what did, why did it work for my special case? We have to look into our data. So you, you don't have a unique answer. That's why really you want to, you see my screen now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, you want to try different methodologies and like I said, go through a loop of different models, regression, it could be gradient boost, random forest, linear regression, polynomial regression, and find the best one in terms of those metrics that I explained, like R squared, for instance, or different errors. But in this case, random forest was the best, but the reason behind it could be this that I, that I explained. And um, I got another question from someone that I wouldn't want to use this curve to train my model. I um, got your message, but I fully disagree. So if I had a very nice curve here, why would I want to go through all these troublesome regression, right? I just go, oh, average frack of spacing cumulative oil production. That is the nature of the data. You need to do pre-processing on the data, outlier removal, do box plotting. And once um, you remove all of those um, unnecessary features, then you combine them together because there are other physics of the problem involved in there. Then you do normalization of your data, standardization of the data to make sure the features are not really having any scalability problems. Some of these, um, such as random forests, are really less biased to the feature scaling, but the others are really um, are susceptible to errors if you don't scale your data. No, the answer is you need to combine all of those features and then you could uh, you know, compare Y versus Y, Apple versus Apple. It's not only one feature that you're um, taking into account. I also got another question regarding the paper link. I just sent it in the question and answers. And um, Pearson correlation, someone asked me, like there are other uh, methodologies that you can use like um, I just wrote it in the messages, but if the data are not really correlating well to one another, it could be the physics of the problem, or there are, um, like I said, some outliers, human error measurements, experimental errors. You want to remove them if you know how it works. One last message that I have is, um, I think sometimes you need to combine physics with your machine learning algorithm. How do you do that? So there are different ways to do it. Some people get use of experiments, and some people get use of numerical simulators or combination of both to make your model not only rely on the data. For um, instance, if um, the, um, like a wellbore stability problem, you have image logs, you can digitize them. You have the log data, you can digitize them, you just use them and you can rely only on them as input data and do your prediction relying on, only on the data. But sometime you know this feature by the physics of it is not gonna play any role in your problem, so you want to remove it. Or you can get use of, um, let's say, for your wellbore um, issue, get use of a geomechanical simulators. I'm coming from a geomechanics background, and I know the physics that are playing a role, let's say, in a wellbore stability problem, what they are, and just focus on them in my numerical simulator. But then it's a trade-off between relying on the simulator or the data to decide for you at the end of the day. Even experiments like prop and embedment or conductivity test. I could do it one way and another guy can do it another way and get different, total, totally different results. Am I relying on the real physics? Perhaps not. So yeah, that was um, some of the questions um, that I tried to answer in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much, Beruz. And, and this, you, is, was, this was yeah. actually an, another example. The, the, the question is that Beruz just answered is another example of the importance of the technical knowledge and expertise that a field uh, expert brings in to, uh, you know, making uh, the results of an AI application understandable. 
Thank you. Is there any questions that the uh, University of Regina uh, uh, presenters think, think they need to answer? Wanted to answer one of them on air, R4. Do you still want to do that? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to answer that question. Here. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, for actually, if, uh, for using the different reservoir scenarios, we just need to first train our model uh, for different, whether it should be a sandstone reservoir or carbonate reservoir. So first we need to uh, train our model. Once we will be able to train our model and the fluid flow analysis, then we'll be able to use this you know, flow model for any kind of reservoirs. So first we need to train that model and then we can use that model for the, any kind of reservoirs. Okay, great. Good. Uh, is there any other questions specifically um, that were, uh, if, if you look at the trail of questions under the answered panel, most of the ones towards the end were for U of R reasons. So there, there, was one, there was one general question that I think it's interesting. Uh, that was the very first question that somebody's asking, of, and it's all to all panelists, what do you think is the largest roadblock uh, with adoption of AI in the oil and gas industry? Is it legacy, compatibility issues, or uh, skepticism of, of the AI? Um, I would let Petro to answer that. <laughs> um, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I mean, it, it's all of the above. Uh, so there is a little bit of uh, resistance that people have you know, they, they don't know, uh, you know, what, what, what are the capabilities of AI. Uh, one of the issues with uh, certain uh, algorithms of machine learning, such as neural networks, they're a black box. So we don't always understand exactly how it works. It, it produces certain results and uh, we, without understanding limitations, we, we don't know, uh, you know, in what cases we can trust it and then what cases we can't. So it's important, like Matt said, and I will reiterate again, that, that uh, we have a human expert that uh, kind of checks and uh, understands how relevant and potentially uh, correct results may be. Um, so it, it's lack of expertise. Uh, you know, companies uh, that uh, are subject matter experts might not have the expertise in uh, computer science and uh, ability to implement some of these tools. And then companies that have the tools and expertise in artificial intelligence may not have the subject matter expertise. And, and like I said just now, it's important to have both. Um, so uh, this, uh, some of the other industries have been quicker to adopt this uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it, it is something we cannot avoid, uh, and uh, it is, uh, again, something that will definitely help all industry uh, to be more competitive, uh, to be able to uh, take advantage of all this uh, volume of data that's now becoming available. Uh, sensors are becoming cheap, transmission storage is becoming cheap. Uh, so we have all this data, and he has been successfully shown to help with many, many uh, different cases. Uh, you know, humans can make decisions, but uh, we cannot make them every second. We cannot look at the thousands and millions of rows of data all the time. So these are tools are going to help us with that. Um, and it, it is it is taking time, but I think uh, there is a lot of a lot of people companies are trying to help in this area. Uh, it's, you know. It, Again, we will over, overcome some of the resistance uh, or else it will just become irrelevant. So it, it is important that we uh, do get on the front of this train rather than, than waiting for, uh, you know, for somebody else to, uh, to do it because uh, that's, that's how we lose our competitive advantage. Great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I know there are lots of questions, but it's about uh, almost 10 minutes past the hour. Uh, so Norm, Ari, I will be getting back to these questions, right? Yeah. To, we, can, we have we can... a total of 16 or 17 listed here. Um, okay. And we do put them into a spreadsheet and hopefully there will be direct replies by the researchers here today. There are two very specific technical ones, one about how you use uh, permeability, how you predict permeability using CT images, uh, which was of course directed towards SRC and then one uh, directed towards the university about the main reason that NN model 
was able to predict the well behavior. But I think those can probably be addressed directly in an, in an email exchange. So perhaps you guys could take a look at those questions and provide some right. response. I think we'll have to. Uh, now, before we end, I would like to ask uh, our CEO, Dan McLean, to please provide us with some closing remarks before we end. Thanks, Matt. And thank you uh, to all the presenters. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 this just makes me feel so old when I hear about uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, but you have to understand, I've been in the business, uh, the oil and gas industry for 40 years. I can remember when the first laptop showed up on my desk in the early 80s. I can remember using a Cray computer. I can remember uh, as a reservoir engineer needing banks and banks of servers to solve uh, uh, complex uh, problems of, of geologic architecture, of geo integrating geophysics and petrophysics and history matching is, uh, and things like that. All of what you talked about is an absolute and natural extension of the things that the industry has been doing for years. Uh, and Adapting it to a neural network uh, is, is, is just something that uh, had to happen. And so going forward, uh, the comment about this is the future, uh, of course it's the future. I mean, we're asking more and more difficult questions. We're getting laser focused on certain things. You drill a horizontal well, what's going on? What is the interaction between a horizontal well and a nearby horizontal well? well how can I understand that better? And that's what these are some of the things we're trying to understand here. Uh, so I'm excited about this. You know, as I said, we were looking for opportunities to support this. Uh, uh, maybe it didn't have the meat that we were hoping for, but uh, you know, what we're trying to do here is demonstrate not the complexity of it, it's complex, but how far we've gone in understanding all of these elements as we come together. So thank you again. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to how this stuff is, is, is applied. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. Presenters and participants. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Bye. We'll be in contact if you had questions. Thanks.